I know it doesn't seem very nice of me to have announced a new project for the channel in my 30th shootout video and not get up close and personal with it in that video. I wanted to tell you this one's story first and how it came to be. This video is all going to be work and it will quash the aspirations of the most impatient rapscallions among you. It will also assuage the patient rapscallions as well. If you missed my shootout video, it was a good one and I have two Gallant VR4s now. But, if we're going to take a closer look at everything, then the dirt, the spider webs, the spider nests, mice, everything that can get waterlogged has to go because I'm washing absolutely all of it. Not bucket washing it or anything yet. This thing is really, really funky and yeah, I just think that cleaning my way down into it with a power washer, uh, that's just the best strategy I can come up with so far. First impressions are, wow, the original clear coat on everywhere there's paint is all still shiny and intact. I wish I could remove that and install it on the green one because I can already tell this one needs bodywork and paint. It's going to have to all be sanded off anyway. I've been over it pretty carefully and everything that matters on the frame and the innards is mint. It's just the outer body skins that need work as far as I can tell. We'll take a closer look at all that later. It's pretty easy to see if the bumper's missing. There's no front axles. Some of the interior was removed. I did reset the front wheel bearings and put the front brakes back on it while y'all weren't looking. But no, there's no engine, no transmission, nothing really left inside the engine bay. Everything that's missing from this car is in my office. None of this is a problem. But what is a problem is it's been indoors for over a decade. And despite the isolation from the outdoors, the outdoors still managed to find its way inside along with a large collection of acorns and a nest that I ejected with the leaf blower. I need to dig pretty deep to correct all the problems that that causes. And for what I need to do moving forward, it actually helps me that this much has been removed already. Like I said, everything that can get waterlogged, everything organic, even more than that, everything I can clean better if I remove it first. Carpet's already gone, but the seats, floor mats, trunk carpet, rear deck lid, door panels, seat belts, it's all coming out. It's beginning to smell better already, but elbow grease will have to be applied to every single part that's coming and going from this thing. If you followed along in the storyline for 1229, you might remember a mold problem that was discovered. Of course, I now have all the remedies to correct that, but this car is no different. At a glance, all the seats look trashed, but it's all a lie. Every single leather seat out there begins molding on its surface the second it rolls out of the factory. Leather is tough and durable, but it's also a protein-rich substrate that's made of meat, and therefore, it's always the perfect sort of petri dish to grow mold in. Mold spores are everywhere in our environment. Just add water or humidity, and every leather seat everywhere will mold. I look at this problem now with a completely different understanding and lens because I found the products that work to fix that. And we'll come back to those because I want to use my daylight to clean out the inside of the car first. I can do all that other stuff at night. Between the air hose and the vacuum cleaner, I managed to remove all traces of the former residence as well as their pantry. The stuff that's left I'll take care of tomorrow when I have more daylight, but I spent the rest of today's just vacuuming and removing things. The seat belts are pretty soiled and we need to get those power washed and soaked. And now I'm gonna go do something really controversial that everyone says you shouldn't ever do. I'm gonna wash my leather seats with a power washer. Water and leather aren't a good mix. It's one thing to get leather soaked and leave it, but it's an entirely different thing to get it wet and then dry it. Water leaches oils from leather, but these aren't coming into my shop the way they are. And immediately following this bath, I'm gonna be treating all of this stuff. I didn't get a good shot of the worst of all of it together, but this is about where we're starting with everything. A power washer is the express lane of leather cleaning. It's not a tool in the master's course. The masters will probably tell you to just use a wet sponge instead. But it's fine to do this if you dry it, clean up the bad stuff, and then promptly re-oil it. And by oil, I really mean conditioner. Just sitting in the open air dries leather out, and it's important from time to time to replenish that. Leather seats that constantly have bodies sliding on and off of them never show mold, but if the seats touch air, mold's there. Left alone in the wrong conditions, which is everywhere other than the desert that comes with a whole different set of ultraviolet and sand problems, leather's going to mold. If the leather feels hard, rough, brittle, or you can't remember the last time you rubbed conditioner into your leather seats, then they probably need it whether or not you're using it every day. I'm using Sterling Essentials Leather Cleaner and Conditioner. It's a two-part, two-process leather treatment developed for horse tack that's the enemy of mold because it's made with citrus oils, among many others that are essential to leather care. Many types of citrus oils destroy mold, but this product is pH balanced to prevent it from hurting the leather, and it prevents mold from growing in it. It's available in eucalyptus, lavender, and floral citrus, whichever scent your horse prefers the most. Buy it from equestrian supply stores instead of the laziest options because you'll be able to get three times as much of it for the same price. 
I let a day pass, and you probably just saw the shot of how much of this stuff the front seat soaked up and how it started to kind of look dry again. It's going to take several treatments before they stop doing that, but already I can tell this made an enormous difference. Just know that the small two ounce jars are only enough to do one four door car twice. I have another eight ounce tub of this stuff, I just want to see how far it goes is all. This isn't something you're going to find in an auto parts or a furniture store. This is one of those cases where Jaffro becomes one with the material to give it what it really wants and needs. To deal with this specific of a problem, you have to be the leather. That takes care of that for now, but I can remove door panels in the dark, so I'm going to keep rolling. I want to get these things out of here before I wash the interior because I don't want the suede and fabric bits getting wet. So I've already set up a workbench on the other side of the shop to triage all of these interior parts that I'm pulling out. And it's got some other cool new things on it to address some of the other problems you've already seen here. These door panels only require a number one and number two screwdriver, preferably JIS, and a nylon pry tool to extract the trim pieces that you're unable to free with your fingertips. It's pretty simple. Remove all the screws, door handles, ashtrays, trim pieces, and lift straight up. No clips. Take the electrical connectors loose and keep all that stuff together. There's the door cards. I only need one courtesy light lens to fix the one orange one. The trunk liner is a piece of molded rubber backed felt. It's a little warped, but I can fix that. What I want to do here is saturate anything stuck to it, and it appears that something got spilled on here and dried into it because it's foaming on one side. Gonna do that until it stops doing that and then hang this one up to dry overnight. The next day I continued pulling the speakers, the rear deck lid, the grills, and the trunk trim out because we're nearing the point where I can finally start cleaning the inside of this chassis. The speakers make for a great place to store all the nuts and screws from doing this. The rear deck lids fasteners are all plastic and the carpet for the deck cover is essentially glued to a piece of cardboard so you can easily crease, damage, or distort that thing too. So I use an interior trim tool to separate these four plastic clips. It fits in place where my big fat hands don't, making all this much easier and less destructive. If you see a shocked face on your screen right now, then you can't unsee it. The seat back padding is just hot glued onto the supports and you're darn tootin' I'm gonna hot glue it right back on there again when I'm done. Now I just have to get one more piece of felt backed cardboard out of here and I think I'm just about done with all the organic stuff. This one's just held on with three plastic clips. So far I'm kind of shocked because there hasn't been one interior screw or fastener missing from anything I've removed yet. The trunk trim has a collection of most of the fasteners that you're going to find all throughout the interior. It has two different kinds of push locks, several different kinds of screws, and some unique threaded plastic fasteners that you can remove by hand. The push lock fasteners that don't have Phillips head screws on them, you can still take loose with a Phillips head screwdriver because you just push them in to release. You don't have to push them out all the way out, just push the center in about a half centimeter and they let go. There's also two threaded plastic fasteners that go on the outside of the rear brake light connectors. Of course, the driver's side has this plastic flap thing that covers the emergency jack and tire tool kit, but you're still not going to be able to get this thing out because of the hard plastic threshold trim that covers the trunk latch assembly. That's held on by four very elegantly but poorly hidden screws. It's pretty easy to see where the screw placement is despite this extra attention to engineering detail. Look, I'm just glad I have them. I told you this thing's complete and undisturbed. Really all this is in incredible shape. Yoink! On the side trunk trim you'll see the familiar plastic push lock fasteners with these Phillips head screw slots. You see these all over Mitsubishi's. The trick to these is to delicately hold the screwdriver and not to mash on them at all. Turn lightly. It will back out far enough that you can remove it with your fingertips. Any pressure here and you'll suffer right now and forever forward. The rest of what's in here is a variety of different screws and look, that one's torn loose, but like I said, all the fasteners are still there. Anyway, I replace all the screws once the part's gone so I keep them in their holes. And of course, don't forget the flap. The speakers don't need to get a bath today, so I'll go ahead and take those out. I'd like to get the rest of the seat belts out of here too, and that involves carefully pulling the plastic trim free first. It's just held on by plastic clips into the body, but you want to be really gentle. Work your way around the part, find the weakest clip to start with, and then keep working around on its neighbors. As you get to the last handful, or generally any of them that give you trouble, be sure to have both hands on both sides of the clips while you pull loose these old plastic parts. My videos may go fast, but seriously, take it slow with this. The shoulder straps, just a couple of 17s and a Phillips head. Just one more side to do and... Oh, I already did it. 
Both of the front seat shoulder straps are in a centrally mounted, complicated, wired pair of spools with sensors, and aside from all that, it's just two connectors, a pair of 17s and 12 millimeter bolts to remove all of it. The non-motorized front lap belts are about as analog and simple as you can get, just four 17s and they pop right out with their plastic shroud. The US Galant VR4s and many other imports from 1991 have these weird motorized seat belts and I removed this whole system, the wiring, all the modules, belts and tracks from my Colt. Weighed them and learned firsthand how this type of safety restraint system is absurdly heavy and electrically complicated. Now that I've told you how I really feel, let's use all that energy to wash the inside of this car. Because once the bucket washing starts, for one like this, I like to start on the inside and work my way out. It feels good to deep clean an old car like this, but what really feels nice after blasting everything loose and sponge drying it is not to come out of it with an orange or brown rust stained sponge. I didn't find anything wrong at all in here that wasn't soap and water soluble. No chemical burns, no rust, nobody's ever been in it except the mice. If I find anything chewed up, we'll just have to have some fun content later of me fixing it but they don't appear to have done anything here that I haven't already cleaned up and removed. Seriously, this looks incredible. I know there's other Gallant owners out there who aren't as lucky as this because I've pulled parts from several of these cars decades ago and found many rotted ones way back then. So the completeness and condition of all of this makes me really, really happy. There's a very large sum of work that I don't have to do here. And with current condition of the parts market for this old car, I'm very, very lucky. I know it. The interior panels and door trim aren't faded. You can tell this car spent most of its life indoors. Even all the original factory tape for the wiring, harnesses, hoses, and cables is still there, stuck down and completely undisturbed. All the plastic electrical harness covers are complete and intact with their fasteners. There's only one piece of padding that I need to replace, and I have it. The dashboard isn't perfect, but I've got a good remedy for that one too. Thank you, John. But let's get to the ugly, and I know you've all been eyeballing this earlier in the video. Let's just go right for the worst of it. Paint's cracked, chipped, outer panel surface is rusted, the dent's pretty severe because it's going every which way, and this one's not likely to come out without replacement or extensive stripping, hammering, dollying, and the whole nine yards. It's not the only thing that's bad on this body, but it's going to take the most work, I think. I don't want to jinx myself, though. There's a pretty good bash in the door. I think this car holds the record for door dings. The outer skins of the body are going to take a whole lot of time and effort, but would you just look at the paint? I have my suspicions that it's already been painted before in its lifetime, but there's a couple of glaring hints that I found on the trunk. But, you know, it's the right color. The paint and the clear coat are still shiny. It's in great shape, other than the dents. But none of the innards on this car are bent. Not, not that I've been able to find. So all this is repairable. I'm just going to walk around the car and show you all the kinds of things on the outer body panels that I'm going to have to fix. Not getting out the grease pencil just yet, but if you can't tell by the line board, I do have a growing collection of body and paintless dent repair tools, and this car presents the opportunity to practice on a good variety of different kinds of dents and things before it gets stripped and repainted anyway. I think that challenging myself with this prior to the car going to prep and paint will ultimately lead to a better finished product at that time. I'm not a pro, I'm just an enthusiast. I have pulled a dent out of a Toyota truck in a Papa John's parking lot using only a toilet plunger before. You couldn't even tell the idiot driver had put his idiot foot through the rocker panel once I was done. Yeah, it was my truck. But unlike that idiot back then, I think this particular idiot now has the aptitude and the patience to learn how to do this. And that's a valuable skill for a guy like me to have. I hope it goes well, but no promises. You'll all be the first to know. My advice is to follow the advice of those who already have the experience doing this. I'm just a guy that's trying to do a thing. And like I said, it's getting prepped and painted anyway, so yeah, I can't hurt anything trying. The passenger side of the car seems to have taken the worst of the door dings, at least the highest frequency of them anyway. The driver's side wins for depth. There's like 30 to 40 of them between the front two doors, but what's really impressive to me is that none of the paint is chipped from any of this. It's hard to see it in this light, but earlier when I was washing it, they showed up a whole lot better, especially with the white car sitting behind it. Taking this whole car apart to clean, inspect, and replace everything means accessing all of this is going to be really easy for a short while. Some of them, like on the rear quarter here, are going to be really easy to fix, but in some places, we'll have to use hot glue and alternative methods to pull them from the outside. I think most all of this is going to straighten up prior to being prepped, and that means less body filler. I'd prefer to use no filler at all and just get it to a stage where I can block it with high build primer, but 
Anyway, some of you might think that's crazy with all this. I think it's doable. If it goes well, the GSX and 1229 are going to get the same treatment too, so it's only going to help everything. You've seen it up close now. Tell me what you think of this body. Only a bit of damage that I have to figure out beyond that dent is this oddly cracked windshield. And this right here is the reason why I think of a lot of this as hail damage. This is an odd circular crack, as if the thing that hit it crumbled and didn't transfer all of its energy. Maybe one of you have had a glass chip like this from something else, but tell me what your experience was. I think it's hail damage. Suddenly there's a carpet. Of course there is. There hasn't been one yet, and it was bound to happen. Mice found this one too. I know the power washer isn't going to fix all of this, at least I seriously doubt it will. I just want to remove the biohazard layer from this and see if it's worth doing anything more before handing it off to someone else who will quite frankly do a much better job. With better equipment than I own. Help out someone else's economy. You already saw me power wash one of these. Oh, really? So I guess it's okay if I missed a scene or two of another one, you know? And then I got this carpet here. It took me a second after I started to realize that this carpet is for the cult. It needed this. It was in a bad way, and I'll send this one off too. Hanging your carpet up for four hours will take at least a day off of its drying time, and a ladder isn't the perfect thing to use, but it definitely works. Back seat belts have a particular odor to them, and step one is removing that. This nylon, painted steel and plastic, whatever stinks can't stick to any of that. Not against 2100 PSI of water pressure, it won't. The Colts carpet came out a far cry from being even good. This Gallant carpet's been dyed before, too. None of them were this color from the factory. There's a rip under the passenger seat and some serious ground-in dirt on the driver's side that's in... Really, it's in pretty bad shape. I don't care that this glued-on driver's foot mat thing is curled up because I'm sure that it's, you know... It's a carpet. It's, I, I'm not using this on either of my projects. The good news is that it didn't come out of either of my gallants that I have. I might get both of these professionally cleaned anyway, but at least the biohazard is gone and I worked on the Colt for a minute. This one's the carpet for 148. It's probably the tidiest of my 33-year-old carpets. Still plenty of stuff spilled and soaked into it from its previous pre-auction owner, but I just kept spraying it until it stopped foaming. A power washer isn't the tool for removing stains. You should use an extractor for that, but my hopes are good for this one because it's the least stained out of all of them that I have. This other one here, this is the GSX. It suffered miserably over the last four years of its life before sitting for a decade, and this is something that I should have remedied a long time before now. Yeah, there's still spilled drinks in here and probably even some spilled oil. It was a terrible thing to have this happen in my former show car, but it happened. There's the beginning of my PDR tool collection, 138 pieces plus a line board. It's a start. People, keep your hose clean. Nothing worse than cleaning up a thing and then dragging your dirty hose across it. WD and a rag keeps you from spreading your filth around. Then, of course, clean up your workspace. I've got a driver's side door panel here. This one, you can see, has some problems. The speaker grill's a bit rusty and beat up, and you can see both the carpet and the suede inserts on this one are in really good shape. Just a little bit dirty. Perhaps this got squished in storage or had something laying up against it in the car. Nothing's cracked and I think I'll be able to massage out or use some other methods to repair most of this pretty easily. The back side of it's pretty dusty and dirty. It's got a rough finish so it's good at trapping that kind of stuff. The electrical box for the door switch has apparently got pulled off by someone who forgot that there were power options here when they were taking it out. Hmm. But they didn't break it and it all snapped right back together. I expect most of this is going to go about this well. I've got my setup with a shop vac, compressed air, a screwdriver, a spudger, some Meguiar's interior detailer cleaner, old-fashioned original armor all, as well as their car wash and wax soap, some WD, OxyClean stain remover, carpet cleaning foam, some microfiber rags, and of course a soft bristle brush. You'll see me use it all, but the first thing I did after blowing everything out with compressed air was spray and scrub both sides of the panel with the interior detailer cleaner. Suede, vinyl, plastic, all of it. Scrub the daylights out of it. It did a great job on the suede, actually. It cleaned the gunk out of the rough inside of the panel, too. And it smells great. I like it. And then next, I oxycleaned the carpet section of the door panel and then vigorously vacuumed it. I just used the cleaner's built-in brush because it was convenient. I used the other two nylon brushes here for cleaning and scrubbing different materials than carpet. The soft brush is great for cleaning delicate stuff and the stiff one's good for scrubbing vinyl. Compressed air delivers more cleaning force than a vacuum ever will, but you need both to be efficient. I always give every panel three coats of Armor All because it's always worked great for me on vinyl. And that's a door panel. 
Sorry about the battery interruption, we'll get another one. This one's got all of its stuff in place. Looks pretty good too. First I'm going to clean it inside and out. You'll see this is a repeating theme here. Give both sides a vigorous scrub down, blasting and vacuuming them, and then take five screws and the speaker grill out. Every Gallant VR4 door panel has a courtesy light in it and that needs to go too. These are simple but can be very tricky to get out. Don't use metal tools to pop the lens off or you can crack or chip it. This is what my nylon spudger is for. Two screws hold that light fixture into the door and now there's our bare door panel. Removing all of that makes cleaning the carpet a whole lot easier. The carpet is tough and the suede above it makes them really comfortable to be around, not gonna lie. Three coats with armor all as always, but that once again revealed some spots where it was time for the stiff Brussels brush and some extra elbow grease before being retreated again. It seems like a complicated collection of products and processes just to clean a door panel, but you can't argue with these results. This light fixture wasn't even dusty. I can see the filaments and the bulbs still good, so I just put it right back in the door panel. Now for the speaker grill, and this is what you missed from the dead battery earlier. It's a metal grill and this one's not rusty, but I sprayed this one down with the interior cleaner, used the soft bristle brush and worked the bristles into the grill back and forth, up and down and all over, front and back, inside and out, cleaned all the dust out, blew it out with compressed air, armor all to everything, and then put it back in the door panel with its five screws. Cleaned the lens and popped it back into its fixture. I love it! But you notice that it's not the whole door panel. There's still lots of other pieces that go into it. The handles, the trim pieces, the plugs, the covers, screws, fasteners. The screws and fasteners you should just be able to wipe down, but for everything else, rubber and plastic, it's time to do some dishes, camping style in a bucket. This is where the car wash soap comes in. It doesn't matter if there's wax in it. The outside of cars today are made of this stuff and it's really sad. So this soap is safe on all of it. This is all rubber and plastic that I'm washing here and I just need the detergent in the solution. The stiff brush and some elbow grease to quickly turn all this orange water brown. Hand washing and scrubbing every single part. If there's anything to be said about the wax in this mixture, it's that it's gonna help these parts resist fingerprints after I dry them off. Next, take them over to the sink for a quick rinse and then back to the workbench again to dry them off using towels and compressed air. Dry it all thoroughly and then clean the switches with the long soft bristled brush. Most of these are finished screws so be gentle. Oxides usually wipe right off and you'll save the finish. Why didn't it fit? Uh, whoa. It's because I got the wrong door panel. Not these door panels. That door panel. Yeah, with that many door panels, it's easy to get confused. I should have noticed that the passenger side doesn't have all those window switches, but I went ahead and cleaned two driver side door panels anyway. Sorry. I had to wash the rear door handles number 148 as well, so while I'm already here doing this, I may as well explain all those other door panels. I already had eight door panels for 1229 because of the four it had in it and another part out that happened close to me. But with 148's complete interior, plus an extra set of rear door panels from 1929, I now have 14 door panels for only two cars. Oh yeah, that brown rusty looking speaker grill. I cleaned and scrubbed that one first, just like I did the other one, but then I took it over to the sink, bucket washed it, rinsed it, dried it off, and that only takes care of some of it. For the orange tinted mesh grill, I did the same thing but with WD-40 and the vast majority of it came right out with a brush. The excess WD I just blew out with compressed air and then I cleaned it all up again, armor all it, etc. The mesh on these is so fine that you can't paint it, but in a pinch you could use a magic marker that you really hate on the mesh's cheese grater like surface to tint it all black again. I already had enough interior parts to make choices for anything that 1229 might need prior to 148 ever showing up, but now I have even more. The fact is, I don't have to replace one single bit of number 148's interior. It's all nearly perfect, but I'm going to give all of these parts a fair shot at glory. I'm going to clean all of it up and figure that out, you know? One of them's going to be a factory original restoration, and the other one's going to be a forged monster. Both of them are going to have a nice interior though. The only problem this creates for me is spending the next seven hours cleaning door panels. I ran out of nothing, and aside from a couple of trips to the sink, I didn't even need to move. I probably saved a lot of time later in life just by doing all of this right now. This is the model of comfort and efficiency for this where I'm standing. 
These products all did a fantastic job removing the stained spots and odors from every single one of these door panels. They took out everything from human sweat to bird shit. I did encounter one spot of an adhesive that took a little extra sweat equity, but I would use every single one of these door panels on my cars. I'll still try using a steamer on some of these dimples to get those out, but overall these door panels for three and a half cars came out great. I'm gonna have to make some hard choices. Seriously, this is crazy. There's two complete sets of front doors. All over there on the wall and in the bucket, there's three sets of back doors. All of the interior door hardware and seats have been cleaned up for 148 now, and I look forward to working all of its dings out because as far as I can tell, only that outer skin poses any challenge to me. I see it as an opportunity to push my skills even farther and to learn new things. There are no such things as problems, certainly not around here. Oh, did I mention I have six front seats and five back seats to pick from? That's excluding the Recaros, of course. Those are for the GSX. And I haven't even started on this one yet. Absolutely none of them are perfect, but between all of them, I'm pretty sure I can make a set that are about as close as you're gonna find to it and still keep it all original. One of those back seats is a mint one from an Evo because you can actually make it fit in a Galant. Oh yes, <laughs> you have a plethora. All of those interior parts, except for one pair of rear door panels, I collected over the years for number 1229, whose interior, as complete as it may be, is in a very bad way. I wasn't sold on the idea of using an Evo seat, so I bought two back seats, just because I forgot I bought the first one. All of this Gallant stuff needs work. It, it really does. Right here, you're looking at an issue plaguing just about every 90s import owner today. The front seat belt buttons are made from a non-UV resistant plastic that turns pink before it turns white. That's supposed to say press on it, but it's totally blown out. That's oxidized plastic. No seat that I have is in any better shape. I have six of these seats and all the front seat belt buttons look exactly the same. But let's get ourselves a better look at this problem, shall we? And if you have the right security Torx bit, then you can pretty easily take this thing apart just by mashing the seat down enough to get it out of your way. I'll just put the Torx security bit number in the comments. I can't read it. Just two screws. There's a seat belt sensor on the driver's side. Look out for that. There's two springs on the inside that go into a specific and obvious orientation, but the whole thing just pops apart. There's your button. See how all the sun exposed areas turn chalky, solid, white? Everything else is a deep, shiny Lego brick red. Plastic oxidizes, not UV resistant. Restoring this is all about knowing your materials, and this time you have to be the plastic. I didn't invent this trick, so I don't give me any of the credit for it. First, I clean it with Windex to remove oil and dirt from its surface. You could use alcohol too. This kind of plastic has a fairly low melting point. I've always heard to use a torch to do this, and I have. I just think it's too easy to brown it even from a distance because it's just too hot. I'm using my heat gun because it's still way too hot. I mean, it can certainly transfer an awful lot of energy into my table and the part, but I'm trying to slowly sneak up on it from a distance and teasing it to flash over. The reason being that once it flashes over, it's gonna change color very quickly and I'll have more time to react before it melts and distorts than I would with a torch. Not all of this went perfect for me. Some of it yellowed anyway, and I had to carefully scrape and remove that to avoid distorting the part, but this is not the only time you're gonna see me do this. And I hope I get a lot better at it. This is also an opportunity to clean up the seat rails inside and out on a workbench instead of in a car. So you know I'm all over that. I don't really need to take much of the seat apart because these here on 148 are already mostly disassembled, but with all the screws back in their holes. Thank you, John. Some people just have good mechanical etiquette. I'm doing all this with just WD-40 and paper towels. It doesn't polish anything, but it easily wipes away most surface rust and all the dust and dirt. Safe on the painted parts, and then we're just gonna cover all this clean stuff right back up again and put these back together. You know I armor all these covers inside and out too. I even wiped down and cleaned all the screws. The seat belt buttons are red again. The leather on these seats is soft and supple now. It absorbed every last bit of the previous two coats of conditioner, and there's nothing else I can do on this except to give it one final extra thick coat of that Eucalyptus Sterling Essentials conditioner and let them bake in the empty dry car to soak all this stuff right up too. I'll do more if I have to. It smells so dang good and works so well that it's my go-to now for old leather. 148's driver's seat is definitely the best one of all six of the front seats. 
Now let me introduce you to the passenger seat. A little bit late because of a battery problem, but it, it's, it got all the same treatment. Clean the rails, plastic trim, handles, fasteners. Put it all back together with the seat belt button that I used a torch on earlier. And one more last thick coat of conditioner to tie them over for now. I'm not changing any of 148's interior so far as I can see it. This seat isn't perfect. There's a split piece of stitching that's soon going to turn me into a seamstress, but it's nearly a tie with the driver's seat's condition once that's been fixed. We'll let these things hang out inside this clean car and make it smell incredible. Look, I've got a red seat belt button again. I love it. Sometimes it's the little things. Let's get that back seat finished up and it really doesn't need much. There's no trim or mechanisms, it just needs one last coat of conditioner. And I'm really lucky to have a back seat like this one, even if it's dimpled in a few spots. I think I can get those out. I just want to condition all the leather and get it soft first, which so far has really helped those dimples a lot. Same deal with the seat back too, just one final coat and we all know what parts I no longer need to be concerned with replacing on 148. I can't get you any more up close and personal of an introduction to this new project than to show you all of its metal, leather, glass, and foam stuff on both sides inside and out. Just pull it all out and clean it and show it to you. I think it's a very good example of why all the body work that's on 148 is worth doing. I don't see anything here that scares me at all. Of course, some things like my GSX carpet are disappointing after this treatment. That didn't turn out so hot on the first pass, but I'm not done with any of these yet. Most of the worst stuff came out, but both of these are still damp two days later. Whatever was foaming that I was blasting out seems to have left a white crusty layer behind. I did say at the beginning of this it's not the right tool to do this with, but 148 is the one that I have the most hope for in the before and afters once they all get the chance to meet the extractor. Despite some minor fading, I think 148's original carpet will be superb for its age and what it's been through. I collected all these seats long before 148 and all of its parts showed up, and that prepared me to deal with anything and everything that I might find wrong with it once it got here. But then you saw what just happened. 148 didn't need any of this collection at all, so all the best of all those extra gallant seats and door panels, handles, lenses, and ashtrays are now 1229's pick. This one right here is my best back seat bottom. It's the straightest and it's the least distorted. It just has a few dimples that occurred sometime before I bought it. And I just want to get all this leather soaking and softening in the conditioner like we did on 148. You didn't even know you were going to get this double bonus episode today, did you? When it comes to the seat backs, this one's one part where I struggle to find a good replacement. Most of them were badly sun damaged, but this one's the best one that I've got. There's places on it where the finish was gouged off by someone hauling something with sharp edges back there, but it scrubbed around and took the finish with it. There's some pretty extensive dimpling around different areas, and I'll give you good close-ups of those, but even though there's at least 10 different damage spots that include the finish being scratched off, it makes the cut for the best seat because it's the softest one with the best headrests out of all of them that I've got. This is the seat that I want to use if I can make it look better than the other one. I really don't want to use the other one if I can avoid it. My best seat actually has more things to have to fix than the one that I don't want to use. Sounds logical, right? You'll see. So all those things where I said, I think I can remove those while working on 148's back seats, let's go ahead and do that right now to these. It still starts with a cleaning. There's no funk that I look forward to melting into any of these seats, but anyone can shrink leather seats fairly easily with just a heat gun and some knowledge of what their material are, what they'll endure, and some common sense. Even if you have a tough leather skin like this, there's still foam behind it. You don't want to learn the hard way that hot leather gets hard or that foam is flammable, but if you're careful and you keep the outer skin's temperature down to a reasonable level, you can make a loose, baggy, or dimpled leather seat skin straight again and tight in only a few minutes' time. I don't recommend doing this on any Toyota branded leather or vinyl looking interiors, but on this kind of leather you can watch as all these blemishes and imperfections just vanish into the material around them. Keep the heat gun moving at all times, and I often use a wet paper towel to visibly gauge how much heat that I'm putting into the part by just getting it damp and then keeping it on working in that spot. So that if I can keep that surface well below boiling, the foam behind it stands a good chance. The heat actually softens the leather, but it still shrinks. It's always a good idea after doing this to apply more conditioner when you're finished, but I can't, I can't do that right now. There's something that I need to fix in the finish that isn't here yet, and I want to do that first before conditioning it. So let's look at that other seat now. This is the back seat that I don't want to use. This might look like the worst of it, but you know that I'm not worried at all about that. Truth is that aside from this headrest, 
That's the only blemish on it if you also count the baggy section just below it. The headrest leather got so hard and sun damaged that it cracked right in the middle. Sure, it could be fixed, but the amount of work required exceeds my patience and skill level. Seriously, the neatest, tidiest armrest out of any of them. Straight and tight seams. If you didn't tell someone that it was cracked, they'd probably never notice. It looks way better overall than the other one, but I'm going to clean it up anyway. That dimple looks really challenging there because it's deeper than all this stuff on the other one. And practice makes perfect, I suppose. This leather is a bit harder than the seat that I want to use, and I'd like to soften it up from whomever is the lucky person that I pass this on to someday when I don't. So there you go, like new Gallant VR4 seat back. Forget that headrest is cracked, you know, just try to forget it. Go ahead, I dare you. Convince me that this one isn't just a brand new seat back. Look how blemish free the leather is and how straight those seams and stitches are. The reason I'm not using this one is because I do believe that I might be able to do even better. So if this one gets set aside and We'll take a look at the front passenger seat replacement for $12.29, shall we? This seat was packed upside down on top of the driver's side, and its headrest stretched the leather of the seat bottom. I didn't think that this would happen, but don't ever do that. Over time, as the seasons changed, the leather got harder in the stretched shape of the headrest, and it kept that shape. The foam and all the stitching are still perfect, spectacular condition, but that deformity is almost its only downfall. Only two other things worth mentioning are some light dimples in the seat back. People, stop hauling around boxes and furniture and cars with leather interiors. Please, it's a sedan. Put it in the trunk. And if it doesn't fit, go get a truck instead of using your rally car. Oh yeah, the other thing. The crusty white sun-faded seat belt button. You've already seen all the fixes for these things, so this passenger seat's just a big fat win all around and a little bit more further practice for me because there's no foam damage to speak of, no busted stitching, no mold, no critter issues, no UV damage, not at all, you know, nothing that my heat gun and some sandpaper won't quickly fix. It's nice being able to do all this stuff on the workbench where I can see and get to everything and to demonstrate how 1229 is benefiting from 148 being here. If both cars need a thing, even if it isn't exactly the same thing, it's still easier to do both cars at the same time, even though it doubles the work for me. Add to that, if anything's different or missing, it lets me fill in the gaps on the second go round. I didn't get the entire headrest print out of the seat bottom, you know, there, but this one needs several rounds of conditioner, no different than 148 did. And we'll come back to it again and try again once the leather's softer. Otherwise, this really old leather seat is once again in spectacular condition. Now, let's take a look at the driver's seat that came out of the exact same car as the one we just cleaned up. This one is a disaster all the way around. Arguably, it's worse than 1229's, and its previous owner was with me when I bought this thing. Looked at me funny when I said that I wanted it. I saw the same thing that he did, I just perceived it differently. What I saw was busted stitching, not ripped or torn leather. But, you know, it does have some of that too. The one thing every seat will do better than 1229 is the foam. I thought that maybe I could swap skins between them, but ultimately even those on 1229 are way too far gone. So to bring all of this back, I actually have to fix this seat. I don't have a choice. And despite my plethora, I don't have another driver's seat to do this with. So my mission is to resurrect this one and repair all of its issues. And issues they are aplenty. Aside from restoring this hide, there's three seams on this one that are split, and there's even a worn out side bolster on it too. I think the frosted layer is fertilizer from living in my shed for a decade. Seriously, it's a mess. But I never found anyone willing to help me fix this thing, so let's go. I ain't scared. I'll, I'll fix this thing myself. This time, instead of a power washer, I'm just using a paper towel. There's a time and place for everything. All these years that's been in there. Can you check that out? I've never looked in here before. A penny. Destroyed penny. Piece of broken glass. Another piece of broken glass. Yet another piece of broken glass. I bought this thing a decade ago and it sat in the same place ever since, so all of its previous VR4 history is just how its owner left it. Glad to have that. I love three 4G63 timing sprocket bolts. This seat is dirtier than all of my other seats, but aside from that and the split seams, it still needs all the exact same things that all the other ones did too. It's in great mechanical order, but I still have to take it apart to get to everything so that I can clean it. And of course, take all the seat skins off. Your average corner auto shop won't usually touch jobs like this because they're not mechanical jobs where you can just buy a part and replace it. Because of the disposable nature of auto parts that's been baked into modern cars, the demand for this kind of work is limited to the people who have a thing worth restoring, because it's expensive. 
And it's expensive because it dominates the time clock of someone who knows how to do it that can do that kind of work. You can look at this two different ways. You can either pay through the nose or learn a new skill. This pushes my automotive topic YouTube channel into an odd realm where once again I'm not using automotive products or tools that I've ever used here over the past 15 years. And if I could pay someone to have done all this for me, I would have, except that I can't find anyone that does this anymore. The people I know who've had this work done in the past paid about $1,500 for a pair of front seat skins or, you know, for repairing the ones that they already had. There's a reason why leather's been a go-to choice for auto mechanics and upholsterers for over a century and a half. It's been used for magneto belts, gaskets, hood straps, window regulators, hinges, lots of other non-upholstery related things along the way, but upholstery is certainly the most popular. And there's a plenty of century-old antiques out there that have their original leather interior still intact inside them. Unlike most synthetic materials, it can be reconditioned, repaired, restored, and even altered. But all I have to do is perform an exact copy of what a sewing machine previously did, by hand, the hard way. The holes to do it are all right here, it's just busted stitching. How hard could that be, right? This stitch is called a double top stitch, but it's three stitches. You don't get any credit at all for doing one of them, but it's three passes on a machine to do it. Only one stitch is actually responsible for holding both pieces of material together, and it's the inside seam. The double stitch that they're referring to are to secure the folded over excess material running parallel to the seam on the back side. And it has an extra piece of fabric that's also stitched to the back of that seam with the padding and the cloth layer. That's like five layers of stuff to have to secure. But that's why you see the two stitches on top. It's popular because it produces a flatter, stronger seam. It didn't take me very long to dig back through my childhood brain cells with the help of a quick internet search to figure out what a bobbin does beneath the foot of a sewing machine. But you have hands and fingers, not a bobbin with all of its parts. So the easiest way to do it, and I'll show you with these pieces of cardboard to pretend that this is our fabric, this amplifier power cable, and the set of RCAs to be our two threads, because my camera will never give you this kind of detail close enough for everyone to see it. Take the bottom thread and just lay it across the seam. The top stitch pierces through the hole, goes around the bottom thread, and right back through the same hole again. Then you move on down the line, through the next hole, around the bottom thread, back through the same hole again. Next hole, on the other side, and repeat. The only thing to look out for to ensure the uniformity of all your stitches is to make sure as you pull each stitch tight that you loop the same direction around the bottom thread each time. And the exact reason why is clearly demonstrated in this example right here. See the angle of the red amplifier cable stitches? On a macro scale, it's obvious, but if you're not consistent, then even on the micro scale, the whole seam can look a bit off when you're finished. It took me about an hour to do the first few stitches from second guessing myself until I finally found the rhythm. And once I did, I started turning up the tempo. Let it be known that repeatedly pulling thick pieces of leather together with coarse nylon thread will help mechanics find blisters they've never had before. So you'll probably see me switch over to gloves and that still didn't help. Well, I shouldn't say that. It, it, it helped me not notice once the blister popped until after I was finished, so there's that. I worked on this several nights after work until I matched the stitch all the way across from end to end, and this was my first attempt at sewing two pieces of leather together so far in my lifetime. I'm not scared, but I'm also not done. I have to do the double top stitches to finish this, so there's two more stitches to complete this one stitch. All I've fixed is the hole. Whether it's a single stitch or a double stitch, it doesn't matter. Whenever you're doing this kind of upholstery work by hand or with a machine, every single stitch is going to be exactly the same. Exactly the one that I just showed you. I filled more than 30 memory cards sewing just the seat bottom back together. It's really boring and it sucks if you're not the one doing it. So can we please fast forward to something different even if it's the same? Thank you. So there's my first stitch, and I suppose I've proven that I'm capable of doing it. I think it came out pretty good. Of course, I used the wrong thread. Uh, this is much heavier duty than the stuff that the factory used. This is a double twisted nylon thread, and it is just harsh. I mean, I don't know if you can see the, the, uh, the texture of it. it it's, it's just really coarse, and yeah, I messed myself up pretty good there. You'll, you'll get sewing blisters is what I've learned. But I did get the right thread, which this is a dark gray, not a black thread. This is closer to what the factory used, and it's much smoother. It's also a lot finer, and this is about the exact 
same sort of thing that they already used here on the outside of both of these top stitches. If this is what they had in the middle, which it doesn't look like at all to me, then I'd understand why it broke, but this center thread looks closer to this. It doesn't really bother me that I used a heavier duty thread on the worst split crack of a driver's seat that's this old. I'm just grateful that all the holes for the stitching were still intact and none of that was what was ripped. It was just the thread. I was able to put all of it back the same way the machines originally did it, only at the expense of my time. That probably took the factory like 30 seconds to do and I filled 12 memory cards and worked for probably six to seven hours doing just that, those three stitches. But on this one, now that I can actually have something here to show you of what it was supposed to originally look like, this one was completely destroyed. This one, unlike this one, I'm gonna have to actually remove this gray backing piece of cloth before we can even get to where the stitches are. All of that before was already all split and I just had to rip a few threads out in order to clean it up enough to do it. But on this one, all the original top stitches are still completely intact. So I have to remove those first. I have to cut those out in order to get to the damaged areas. And this time, because I've come closer to matching the thread, I don't need to redo the entire seam from end to end like I did here. On this one, I only need to just repair the section that's messed up. So I'll probably cut the threads back on the top stitching from here and here. I think that's, that's what I'm probably gonna wind up doing, just cleaning all this stuff out of here. That way I don't have to spend six to seven hours on it. I can probably do this a whole lot faster. But then I have to replace all the stitching for the backing. And I did that here. You can see all my stitches here. It's much heavier duty thread than the factory used. There you go. So, but to remove this, you know, I got all the tools I needed for probably about 40 bucks to do this. All the hog rings, all the pliers, all the sewing tools, the thread, all the stuff that's made in China you can buy on Amazon and get right to your front door next day. It's the things like uh, a can of Kiwi shoe polish from Racine, Wisconsin. That uh, These are the types of things that wind up taking 10 days and cost $11 and have a dent in them. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and split these seams and get to the rest of this stuff and see if I can make this look better. And just because I'm using the professional Singer tools, it doesn't mean I know what I'm doing. That was my first upholstery stitch in my entire life. And I think that I've done a pretty good job of figuring it out and reverse engineering what the sewing machine does. But the... the yeah, I, I just bought these because these are the kinds of tools that my mom used when I was a kid. She had a lot of Singer equipment and uh, I'm just used to seeing it around so I was like, you know, I'll buy that. I don't really know anything about sewing. Well, you know, I made an oven mitt in the seventh grade and I suppose I had, yeah, I did do a needle point and yeah, and I did learn to pull, uh, how to do, um, did learn how to do cross stitching, but it doesn't mean I know anything about upholstery. I'm just getting lucky. I'm glad you're following along and watching this. A seam ripper is a critical tool for doing upholstery work or sewing because it gets tedious work done fast and it lets you quickly remove your mistakes. So a seam ripper is to an upholsterer what a grinder is to a welder. It's a must have. Undo stitches or cut seams with the same tool. There's the last stitch. So I did that about right. There's the first stitch. There's the last one. So now I only have to fix a section between this wide and this wide. Right there. See that? And I need to clean all of that out of there. So for the first stitch, I've got the needle stabbed in here where I'm gonna start. You see it's one over from where the thread has been pulled back through. I'm going to thread the needle with the strong stuff because this is the main seam, this is the center seam, and that's the one that takes the most stress and pressure. It took me about a half an hour just to prepare that one short section. You'll need to tie off and secure the threads on both ends, whether they're existing stitches or for the ones that you're adding. And I'm tying off the existing ones last because I plan to pull the new ones really tight first. 
Then it's back to 12 more of the 30 memory cards spent just on this bottom seat cushion restoration. Okay, I can't take this anymore. Cut. I get it. I, I get why this is expensive now. Here we are with the bottom seat support, the foam and the cover. There is a cushion cage with springs attached to the seat bottom that I've got to reassemble first, which that's really easy. And I carefully split the adhesive on the front seat bottom when I was taking it apart so that I could glue it back together afterwards. Spray adhesive works fine for this, but I don't have it yet, so I'm just using body trim adhesive, which also works fine for this too. With the seat bottom, foam, cage, and spring assemblies all put back together, the seat skin can go back on and to attach that you just need hog ring pliers. And I squished that way too quick. Probably none of that's in focus. Anyone can operate this tool. Metal rings. You get it. Squish. The hog ring's tension that pulls the seat tight is aided by metal wires that are sewn into the fabric seams across both of the sides, and also along the lowest point of the seat bottom. Eight hog rings secure the bottom seat skin and foam into the frame. There's also two plastic clips that run around three quarters of the circumference of the seat bottom, and I always start on the back and front sides of that first, before making the rest of the way around just so that it pulls evenly. After securing all the final bits, flip this one over, give it a good cleaning and some shrinking with the heat gun, and this is that old split beat up seat bottom cushion that was covered in fertilizer and bird shit. I saved it. Well, sort of. There's still the seat back that we have to contend with. But let's not get too far ahead of my own suffering and just enjoy this victory for a moment. This right here, out of all of them, is suddenly the best driver's seat bottom that I have. And it's for $12.29 too. This is something it's always wanted and now it has it. It wasn't going to have this any other way. And I've done it. Okay, now back to my suffering. To get the seat back skin off, everything's a whole lot more complicated. There's mechanisms inside it that have controls on the outside. It's held together first by two covered screws attached to the panel and the pocket just slides off easily once you get those out. But then there's hog rings galore, sometimes connected to the frame, sometimes to support wires. There's a pair of headrest sleeves stabbed into the frame and the only way that you can get those out without breaking them is to compress the clips from the inside of the seat back and tap it through to the metal pipe that it's jammed into. There's the thing. Some of the hog rings are a pain to get out to allow you to get to the seat skin, but not for me because this foam is badly damaged. We'll look at that. And suddenly it's fixed because we're not looking at me sewing this one giant split seam back together with the big thick angry thread. I'm putting my foot down. It's useless editing any of that at this stage, so let's just skip it all. I was, it was actually just a single stitch, but it went through eight layers of fabric and this footage is repetitive now. We get it. But yeah, my hands feel it. This is hard. It takes a long time. It looks simple. It's, it is simple. It takes easy tools and techniques to do all of it, but it's still a whole lot of work because it's long, it's hard, and it hurts. Just like many other professional skills do. So if you can make more money doing something else, then by all means go do it, but I'll always have a greater sense of satisfaction sitting in this seat to take me there than the one I had when I started this. This is the kind of joy that you can experience restoring a car that wasn't made by robots. Here's a look at that holy foam Batman. Along the side bolsters, there's supposed to be two support wires hog ringed to the seat cover. And they were, but somehow just not on this one side, but across both sides, they both got pulled through. Probably due to broken stitching. While sewing that skin back together, I noticed the factory pierced the stitch while installing a hog ring, so the split in the seat back was a factory defect that was actually caused by the assembler. So be careful installing your hog rings. But anyway, with the skin off, the foam comes out of the frame pretty easily, except the shoulders. You know, it's secured with a small amount of spray adhesive. Remove that carefully so that you can glue it back. And there's the foam. Blow it clean and wipe it down because for my next trick, I'm going to repair a part for which there's no modern replacement. But in a way, where it's better than anything else that I have the confidence or the time to make. We're going to fix this foam. I don't have a choice. I can't put this seat back together properly if I don't, and the foam in 1229 is far worse than this because it all shrunk and turned hard. The pins that get hog ringed to the wires that are stitched into the skins that secure it to the seat, they need something to grab onto, and over the years those wires can tear through that foam, and this is how you fix it. 
I like to start by first figuring out how big of a piece of cloth that I'm going to need. Walmart sells two yards of cotton fabric for six bucks, spray adhesive is 16. Once I got that figured and cut out, it doesn't need to be pretty. First, I like to just apply some adhesive inside the cracked and broken sections of the foam and hold it until it sets, trying to get it to stick mostly back together straight again before I begin. This helps it keep its shape properly and works to prevent the damage from continuing to crumble and spread and deteriorate inside my repair. Then I coat that area that I'm repairing in spray adhesive and then that piece of cloth and spray adhesive too. I let that set up and thank goodness we're editing that three minutes out. But now you can center the cloth and stretch it around past all the damaged sections. And this is the backing that's now going to support the hogering wires and the foam. Don't worry about the lack of holes in it. We'll fix that later by poking something sharp through it. None of this needs to be pretty. I could have stopped there, but I'm going to do both sides to prevent the cracked sections from getting any worse and to give it some extra reinforcement. On this side, I start at the bottom of the foam, glue that down, and then I work my way up the center. Once I'm ready to make the big turn, I cut some relief cuts to avoid distorting the foam when I stretch the fabric tight and then continued working from the center out. After covering all the areas that would benefit from reinforcement, I trimmed off the excess and the foam is now straight and solid again. That means it's time to prepare the skin to shove the foam back into it. This one has six hog rings that attach to four support wires inside it, and some of that I left assembled to remind me where to put it all back again correctly during reassembly. I'll probably still do it wrong. But this is where those hog ring pliers come back out again and make you glad that you fixed the foam. This is slowly starting to resemble a seat again. Once you've poked all the holes for the hog rings and fastened them all where they belong, then you can apply some spray adhesive and install the seat frame. Stretch it all into compliance before the glue sets. Install the headrest guides, the lumbar support lever, stretch it all into place, hog ring the outside of the seat back to keep the skin tight, and then cover up the hole with the pocket and install the screws. Not necessarily in that order, but sort of. And there's a completed seat back. I've done nothing yet to clean and condition this outside of the sponge bath, but I already like what I see. I just need to put the seat bottom and all its cohorts back onto its frame and then clean it all back up again just like we did on the other ones. Put the trim covers back on, the handles back on all of them, put the big spring back into the seat belt latch that fell out on the floor while I was putting it back together. Caught that one, not getting away from me. The seat bottom uses four tapered self-centering bolts. Don't tighten any of them before you get them all threaded first. Then honk them all down and we'll have a seat that's badly in need of conditioner. At this stage, I'm running low on or almost out of the big bottle of spray cleaner. And I've used almost eight ounces total of the conditioner to get this far. If you add all this up, that's enough for four front seats and four complete back seats with uppers and lowers to get three coats of conditioner on all of it for over a period of three weeks. So the big bottle of cleaner and an 8 ounce tub is enough to treat all the leather in one Gallant VR4 12 times. I have about 2 ounces left in this tub and that's how much I had in the small jar. That's what it came with. You remember this, don't you? This is where we started with this seat. This is the seat that Justin looked at me sideways for when I wanted it for 50 bucks 12 years ago. I just want to tell you all to look at old used auto parts and cars differently. There's diamonds mixed up in all that rough. My worst driver's seat is now my best one. No more split stitching and the leather is every bit as soft as the passenger side that came out mint. I refuse to wipe off the excess. That shininess is going to calm down as it all soaks in and it's a whole lot of time and elbow grease to bring something like this back to its original condition. This is only one part of a vehicle restoration though. I think it's one of the most important ones. After all, this is the driver's throne. It takes time for the conditioner to soak in, and some parts of the leather are drier than others, which is why you really need to go over it a few times before it stops doing this. You can see precisely what I'm talking about right now in the video. By the time the dry spots subside, you've got conditioner evenly throughout the material, and that's when the shine calms down. This is the difference between one treatment with the conditioner and three treatments of conditioner. See how much more even that is? still soaking in several days later after applying it. It never soaks all the way in when you put it on thick like this, but one coat after a week, three coats. You end up with more even results after a few passes once the hide becomes hydrated evenly. Eventually, a thin coat leaves a smooth, soft, even finish behind. 
Earlier I said that I want to do a thing to a back seat that I'm using before I condition it. The shoe polish came in while I was doing other things and there's some scratched pieces that have lost their finish. Some are more visible at different viewing angles and I can't take some of that out without causing more harm to the part before fixing it. I never set out to make 1229 the bell of the ball so what I'm doing here should suffice to hide this prior damage. This leather is finished. The finish got scratched off and the shoe polish will put one right back on there again. Does a fantastic job of hiding things on leather as well as protecting that damage so that it doesn't get much worse. So I just massaged it in, brushed it in real good to make sure I coated every nook and cranny on the surface and then wiped it all right back off again. Naturally, it's gonna leave shiny spots around where I did this and you can't avoid that unless you did the whole part. But I don't want to change the tone of its appearance, so I'm just moisturizing the entire part with conditioner now to blend the two. I wanted to refinish the dry leather prior to conditioning it. That way the shoe polish doesn't have to compete with the conditioner in order for it to soak in and do its job. I believe it's easier to blend it back in with the conditioner, and you can see that trick working right here. The scratches are a whole lot less pronounced. They are indeed subdued. But that's just how I make lemonade out of this. Once I get all this conditioner soaked in and the leather softened up, this one's going to be spectacular. Of course, that process takes a lot of time, and I've taken enough of yours already, so I'm removing all the parts I wish to replace and putting their replacements where they belong to show you what all this is for. This car is every bit as complete as number 148, and its owner went out of his way to get every clip and fastener that belonged in it back in it, so even things like the seat rail covers were all accounted for and unbroken. That's a gift for securing all the restored, non-faded stuff that we've collected for it. I said we because even Justin started stockpile of parts that he wanted to put on it before he sold it. So, takes a village to restore a Galant. I'm not going to miss any of these seats. This car's previous owner fought with them for years and none of the products that were used on them managed to help. It just kind of slowed down their decline. When he acquired the car, all the leather was already damaged. The back seat headrests were split before 2000 when my eyes saw this for the first time. There is no fixing that problem back on the day when it arrived in Justin's life, but this is how I'm dealing with it in mine today. I still have several more coats to spread on this stuff, and I'm not permanently mounting it yet because all my carpets are going to the extractor. I'll probably take some of the other rear upholstery items with me just to get a second opinion, but we'll make that in another video. There's lots of interior plastic things to clean up still. You saw all that stuff was in perfect shape. This should leave you with no questions about why the interior needed to be replaced rather than restored. Sun fading, shrinkage, brown edge, hard foam, ripped foam. You can see the hog ring wires poking through the front of the seat. Rock hard leather seats, mold, some kind of wax. You'll see swirl marks on it here and there, mostly on the back seats. The bolsters worn like all the others. Sun bleached seat belt button. Come on, man. The stitching split, how about that? Why would you try to repair this? It's shrunk so bad on the other side that it's flat as a pancake and if you fix the other side stitching, it would probably tear those. The passenger seat, and look how dry that is. It isn't in any better shape. It's all shriveled up, sun damaged, and threads are begging for mercy from all of it. The only things you need to do this kind of damage are humidity, sun, and age. So naturally, the back seat has every single problem that you've seen me fix in this video and more. All this stuff feels like sandpaper. But check this out. The back seat headrests look like they need flies buzzing around them. They're cooked. They're never coming back. This is the driest, hardest back seat that you're ever going to find. This car had a hard life even before Justin bought it, but it's lucky he bought it because he did so much to improve it, and he even collected things to fix some other problems that it has. The new leather is my contribution to this car's future, and this was always how I wanted to deal with it. Both interiors are going to be toit. Both of these cars will restart their lives as zero-mile engines, but this is what it's going to say on the odometers. And now you've seen all of the techniques that I use to do all of it. Like polishing aluminum, maintaining leather is an ongoing project that never stops, but it's a whole lot easier. It keeps getting softer with the conditioner, and I still have a way to go with this, but my game plan for both of these builds solidified while I was doing this. In honor of John, this beautiful sunroofless, low-mile, clean, rust-free, 33-year-old car is going to be the full factory restore candidate. That wasn't my original plan, but it certainly is now after seeing all of this. The reason being is that now I've been through all the worst of both cars, and I have exquisite specimens for replacement of any part on either one. To the extent where both interiors will be competitive with one another, I'm happy. Very happy. 1229's biggest flaw is fixed in this video, and I got to give you a close-up view of this new project. 
the decade-long parts collection for this day just paid off, and I got to share my experience doing this with all of you in case some of you might benefit from it. Maybe you have one of those cool old fun things with a leather interior in it. Restoring a car is not all about wrenches and machining, though. It's really about the details, and that can easily mean dozens of hours with a needle and thread if you end up being the one to have to do all of it. Just build your dream, man. But on this one, I'm willing to build someone else's, but only because it's cool. I've been sending John progress updates all along as I've been working. His enthusiasm about all of this progress has been a real inspiration to me, but I'm sad to report that he experienced a heart attack while receiving dialysis last week. Complications resulting from that were too much for him to overcome. I want him to see all this, and I know how much he enjoyed seeing it all happen. I just hope that knowing 148 was in capable hands being restored brought him peace and encouragement along the way. I'm at a loss because I needed that enthusiasm. This was very unexpected. My heart goes out to Melissa and John's family. They set up a GoFundMe to help them sort out their immediate needs for those of you who wish to show your appreciation for such a selfless human being. I'm donating all proceeds from this video to help however I can, but everything we learn from the process of restoring 148 will always be John's gift to all of us. That's all he wanted from me. He just wanted this car to continue to live so that others could enjoy it. Thank you, John Cook. I'm going to make you proud.